So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Torsional Vibration uh, Seminar. Uh, we will present you today uh, the, the usefulness of a Torsional Vibration Monitoring System uh, in a power plant. So the speakers today are myself, I'm uh, Sebastian Grégoire, I'm the responsible of uh, the uh, Vibration and Mechanic team at Laborelec and uh, Fritz Petit, who is uh, our uh, expert uh, in uh, torsional vibration uh, uh, monitoring. So first I will uh, start with a brief introduction uh, about uh, NG Laborelec. So Laborelec uh, is a leading expertise and research center in electrical power technology. Uh, we were founded more than uh, 55 years ago and we have a large experience in the uh, power sector. We are a cooperative company and NG is uh, our uh, main uh, shareholders, but other shareholders uh, include uh, grid operators and other uh, electricity actors. We are focused on the entire electricity value chain from generation to transmission and distribution, storage industry and end user. And we put a strong focus also on the energy transition uh, and the 3Ds, uh, that means decentralization, decarbonization, and digitalization. And we offer specialized services, R&D, and product in each of these domains to company in all over the world. Uh, so we are uh, present in more than 60 countries. So as I said, our uh, the expertise uh, is uh, focused on electrical power technology, and we also focus on high value delivery for its customers. So uh, we, we are a team of experts, uh, and uh, our passion is to solve complex technical challenges. So we are not uh, interested in the day-to-day -day activities. Of course, we also perform day-to-day -day activities to support our services, but uh, our main uh, added value and our passion is really to solve complex technical challenges. We are uh, 240 high skill specialists in different uh, activity domain. Uh, for instance, uh, vibration and rotating equipment, chemistry and water technology, materials, power plant integrity, electrical machine and grids, combustion emission, process engineering and automation. And we have also uh, the state of the art uh, laboratories and measurement equipment to, to uh, solve all your problem uh, and, uh, and to help you to find a solution. So now we will start with uh, the, the webinar about uh, torsional vibration. If you have any questions, please use uh, the chat uh, and, uh, and ask your question to NG Laborelec. We will gather all those questions and we will answer uh, the, those at the end of the presentation. So now I will give uh, the presentation to, uh, to Fritz that will talk about uh, the, the torsional vibrations. Okay, thanks uh, Sebastian. So uh, hello everyone. Um, today on torsional vibrations, uh, we'll start with an, uh, a lightning strike. Um, yes, it's electricity, but it's not really in the form that we want it. And in fact, it can even uh, harm your uh, shaft line. So how is that possible? Well, your mechanical shaft line is connected with the electrical grid by means of the generator. So the electromagnetic a field in between the rotor and the stator actually couples the mechanical part being the shaft line to the electrical part being the grid. And so any perturbation on the grid will be felt uh, mechanically in the shaft line. So you have a true coupling uh, electrically, mechanically. And the issue with torsional vibrations is that damage actually comes without warning. Um, you could have certain changes in grid configuration, which can cause damaging shaft line torsional vibrations. Um, examples which will be further detailed are um, when you have series capacitor compensation on the grid, um, HVDC stations or la new large uh, consumers, for instance, arc furnace uh, Arc, arc furnaces, those components, those main uh, major components are known to uh, have potential interaction between the grid and the power plant. Um, and the issue with torsional vibrations is that these are not monitored by default. So you typically have your radial uh, vibration monitoring, which is online and which is 
monitoring the entire time. But for torsion vibrations, this is not the fact. So the damage can be catastrophic uh, and also occurs without warning. At best, the radial vibration monitoring trips the machine before reaching the critical crack size, but damage can be done really in the order of minutes. So it happens really fast. And if it happens, uh, you can see some examples on the right. Uh, for instance, you can have uh, a rotor cracking. So the middle picture where you have crack initiation at a fillet uh, transition of a larger diameter to a smaller diameter, typically near couplings. Uh, the figure below is uh, retaining ring failure, which is also the cause of torsional vibration where you have actually fretting fatigue of the shrink fit uh, surface of the retaining rings with respect to the generator rotor. Um, the top figure is uh, damage at the low pressure, typically the last stage uh, blades of the uh, low pressure steam turbine, which are known to be able to dy dynamically couple with the uh, rotor torsional vibrations. So these are uh, main uh, examples of damage due to torsional vibrations which have already occurred and which are still occurring and are considered to be uh, more at risk in the future due to changes everywhere uh, on the grid. So the outline of the presentation um, will start with an introduction on torsional vibrations. It's the most important characteristics. Um, then from the practical point of view, we will explain how these are typically measured, um, how the criticality is assessed, uh, when do you consider torsional vibration amplitudes to be critical, yes or no. And the fourth item is on monitoring and protection. So we will then present our uh, torso system as well as some uh, examples of measurement campaigns. So some important characteristics first, uh, the basics of torsional vibrations to get everyone on the same line. On the left, you see a basic cylinder, um, which in torsional vibrations has different natural eigenfrequencies. So you can see here for this simple cylinder on the left, the first three modes. Uh, the first one is the most simple one where you have a twisting motion of both ends um, in the counter phase and an anti phase um, against each other. The more, the higher you go in frequency, so we go to mode two, mode three, the more complex the deformation gets. So, torsional vibrations is actually a twisting motion of the shaft superimposed on the steady state rotation. So, if you go to the right of the slide, you can see a typical gas turbine shaft line where you have the lowest three natural frequencies in torsional vibrations. So let's look at the first one, the uh, here highlighted at 18 Hertz. This is uh, merely an example, but it's more or less uh, the order of magnitude around 20 Hertz for a gas turbine shaft line. So what you can see is that the gas turbine and the compressor uh, rotor are twisting in anti-phase with respect to the generator. And this happens at 18 Hertz. So if something happens on the grid, you're running at the 50 or 60 Hertz uh, speed, superimposed on this nominal speed, you would have an eight 18 Hertz uh, torsional vibration. The more complex modes are uh, already at much higher frequencies, and they, these are already what they call super synchronous, so above the grid frequency, and the deformation is also more uh, complex. So the 95 hertz there, you can see a deformation already within the gas turbine and the compressor, while the generator is almost doing nothing. Uh, at 130 hertz, you can see that it's more the generator mode, uh, while the gas turbine and the compressor are doing nothing. So this is, in general, how the dynamics of the shaft line occur. The lowest natural frequencies um, start, um, let's say, for steam turbines around 6 hertz, go to 20 hertz. And the, the higher you go, um, for instance, here for the gas turbine, if you go super synchronous, 
those are typically less of importance. So the main uh, important ones are those subsynchronous ones, uh, which will be explained uh, further on. So some important differences between the radial vibrations and the torsional vibrations. Um, radial vibrations, as you know, is in the horizontal and vertical plane. Uh, they are usually sufficiently damped and the excitation comes from the unbalance itself. So it's uh, internal excitation. Uh, they're closely monitored. You have clear and uh, advanced criteria and the vibration is felt on the casing. If your machine is not well balanced, you can hear it, you can see it, you can feel it. So um, the monitoring is quite well. For torsional vibrations, um, you're looking at angular vibrations. So it's in the rotational frame. They are very lightly damped because your shaft line, um, you do not want your uh, shaft line to have high damping in the rotational uh, sense. So this is why torsional vibrations by default have a very light damping. The only damping comes from the material itself. The fact that you shear the material by deforming it uh, puts a little bit of damping, but it's very low. The excitation typically comes from the grid. So it's outside of the power plant. And that's the main issue. You connect your power plant to the grid. If you're not knowing what happens in the grid, um, then you could have a potential interaction. And the issue is that it's not yet closely monitored. You do not have, a, by default, a torsional vibration monitoring on your shaft line. So you're actually blind to whatever potential interaction with the grid uh, may be. There are no clear criteria and standards. We'll come back to that later. And it's a hidden vibration. You could look at a machine um, which has no radio vibrations whatsoever. You would be thinking that it's uh, running smoothly, um, while in reality, it could uh, experience excessive torsional vibrations which are damaging the machine. So the issue with torsional vibrations is that the rotor torsional vibrations are not transferred to the stator casing. So you do not see it, you do not feel it. Um, if you have issues, it happens uh, typically uh, without warning. So it's a, a hidden vibration. Excitation, as explained, is mainly located outside of the power plant. Uh, you have a difference uh, between transient loads and steady state loads. The transient loads, as you can see from the example below, uh, typically in the order of 10 seconds uh, and are excited by short circuits, for instance, uh, line switching operation, uh, synchronization out of phase, or a sudden load rejection. These are all examples where you excite the shaft line in torsional vibrations, but as you can see below, typically within 10 seconds, the amplitudes are uh, already below uh, critical levels. In steady state loads, you have as examples unbalanced phase currents. So the um, natural unbalance of the three phases on the grid um, that you have all, the entire time. You could have HVDC stations nearby the power plant, uh, power electronics, uh, subsynchronous resonance will be detailed further on. Um, or large consumers like electric arc furnaces for steel productions nearby the power plant. These are all examples where you have uh, excitations during a much longer time span. So an example is given uh, below in the figure where you have, uh, for instance, 10 minutes. It could go up to one hour, several hours. Um, so depending on the phenomenon. If you have any issue with these steady state loads, if you go beyond the fatigue limit, then you are really damaging your machine and you could induce a, uh, a crack somewhere on the machine um, after a certain time due to the accumulation of the fatigue lifetime damage. The ISO standard gives an overview of different excitation disturbances on the grid. Um, so you can see they're subdivided in transient and steady state ones. And on the horizontal, on top horizontal bar, you can see the effect it has on the uh, machine. So you can, the type of disturbance can be a, a step change. It can excite at line frequency, twice line frequency, 
or anywhere in between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 of line frequency. The norm is well, there is a, a, a good guideline on uh, line and twice line frequency and by design typically the OEM ensures that there are no torsional natural frequencies close to once and twice line frequency. Uh, so that's typically uh, okay. Um, the third, the last column, however, excitation in between 0 0.1 and 0 0.9, where you uh, have, for instance, uh, subsynchronous resonance, there you have phenomena where you have interaction with the grid, where you can reach unstable regimes and drive the system, your mechanical system, into resonance. Those are the most important ones. Uh, so the most important examples, well-known examples, are subsynchronous resonance, um, where the, uh, these are critical when you have long distance transmission lines, which are compensated by fixed series capacitors. Um, this can lead to unstable behavior. Uh, more details further on. Subsynchronous torsional interaction as well, for instance, with HVDC stations, or electrical arc furnaces, uh, damage has already occurred in the past. And the third one is excitation at once or twice grid frequency. So these are related to uh, unstable regimes, resonance, where you uh, excite the mechanical shaft line up to a torsional vibration amplitudes, which are damaging the machine. So we will now more detail the SSR, subsynchronous resonance. And the most simple example is given on the right. You have a shaft line which is modeled by two inertias coupled with a string so for instance your gas turbine coupled with a generator and then you have the on the right the grid which is uh, modeling just the transmission line and the series capacitor bank by implementing the series capacitor bank the grid on its own uh, gets a natural frequency so any disturbance will excite the natural frequency of the grid and you will have subsynchronous currents on the grid. They will reach the generator due to the electromagnetic uh, gap and the electromagnetic torque. They will excite the turbine. And if there is a match between the electrical grid frequency and the mechanical shaft line frequency and torsional vibrations, you could have an unstable regime. Um, so this is one important example which has already um, caused a lot of damage um, on, on shaft lines. Typically the risk for having such an interaction with the uh, grid um, for the SSR is done by frequency scanning. So how uh, is this done? Well, one looks from the generator towards the grid and then the electrical undamping or the impedance is uh, determined as a function of frequency. So for every frequency in the grid, you have the impedance or the electrical undamping, and this has to be uh, related with the mechanical side. Um, so the, the simulation is actually uncoupled. You only regard the electrical one, and you check in the grid which frequencies are prone to have uh, interaction, and if your mechanical uh, torsional natural frequencies are coinciding with these electrical ones, there's a potential for interaction and issues of resonance. These are checked in uh, many different configurations of the grid. So uh, typically every, th every time there's a, a, a change in the grid configuration, uh, this type of risk assessment should be uh, renewed. Mitigation and protection is of course uh, possible, but again, it, it should be done for every grid configuration. So it can be done on the network level or on the power plant level. On the network level, the most um, yeah, straightforward one is to bypass the series capacitor bank, which is causing the interaction. Uh, you can implement also active damping, passive damping. So different uh, examples or solutions exist. On the power plant level, um, you can, for instance, implement a passive filter to block any subsynchronous currents that arrive at the power plant, or you could trip the machine by means of a torsional motion relay protection. So this is, for instance, the torso, uh, which protects your machine, decouples it from the grid when a uh, interaction and uh, interaction with the grid appears, which could drive the system unstable and uh, consume lifetime of your rotor. 
Um, other examples are uh, armature current relay protection, so also based on the electrical measurements. Um, so on the power plant level, typically what is implemented is uh, a trip, an automatic trip based on measurements of the mechanical torsional amplitudes or the electrical parameters. The standards, um, they do not give clear criteria on these phenomena, so the only focus is on the guide is guidelines on frequency margins with respect to once and twice grid frequency. So a table is given, as you can see on the right, uh, which um, recommends exclusion zones from these um, excitation frequencies. So any time when a disturbance occurs, a short circuit, an unbalance on the grid, you will excite the machine at once and twice grid frequency. So in order to avoid resonance, uh, the norm stipulates these exclusion zones. Um, the idea is to ensure that the dynamic stress due to a transient fault is acceptable. So this is the ISO standard. You have also from the American Petroleum Institute, uh, a standard which is uh, not directly related to power plants. It gives some guidelines on modeling uh, and stress and fatigue calculation. Uh, there's also uh, quite some tutorials uh, done by APRI, um, who has invested as well uh, in the 80s quite a lot in um, gaining the understanding on torsional vibrations. So there are some references that are really interesting to, to look at. Um, on the right, you can see an example, for instance, as well, if um, for the uh, ISO standard, uh, the frequency margin also holds for the uh, steam turbine blades. So here, typically, the uh, last and prior to last blade roads uh, have to be included in the torsional vibration model to check whether there's no any dynamic coupling between uh, the rotor and the steam turbine blades. If these have natural frequencies close to once or twice uh, grid frequency, you could as well induce uh, excessive torsional vibrations of the blades and induce uh, crack initiation at the roots uh, where the highest stress occurs. So this is typically uh, checked by means of finite element simulations based on a scan or detailed geometry of the blade and then included uh, within the uh, torsional vibration model. So this was an overview of the theoretical side. So to remember is that uh, torsional vibrations are excited uh, typically by the grid. Um, it's a twisting motion of the shaft line uh, superimposed on the steady state rotation. Um, frequencies typically are in the range of uh, 6 hertz um, to 20 hertz, depending on what, what type of shaft line you have, gas turbine, uh, steam turbine. Um, and the higher the frequency, the more complex and typically um, the harder it is for the grid to transfer energy in the mechanical part. So typically the most prone ones for uh, damage or for torsional excitation are the lowest ones. Um, these are also most the, the ones most prone for uh, any subsynchronous resonance phenomenon or subsynchronous torsional interaction. Um, the other potential issues are typically well uh, covered in the design. These are excitation at once and twice grid frequency. So there the norm stipulates guidelines on the exclusion zones from these frequencies. Um, so now uh, we step from the theoretical side uh, more into the practical side. So how can you measure torsional vibrations? Well, torsional vibrations is typically a measurement which is based on pulse position modulation. Um, on every shaft line, you have a speed sensor to um, be able to determine the speed at which your machine is running. And actually, this speed sensor is also typically used as a torsional vibration sensor. It is typically placed at a tooted wheel and what you do is every time a tooth passes, you generate a pulse. So in the end, you have a pulse train, as you can see on the right. If your machine is running without any torsional vibrations, 
the time in between two pulses will be uniform. So if you have torsional vibrations, then the time in between two pulses will start to vary and you will see it in the measurements. So in the end, it's a very precise speed measurement. So instead of um, looking at the static part of your speed measurement, you're now looking at the dynamic part. So you're not looking at uh, my machine is running at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. You're looking at uh, what on top of this 50 or 60 hertz my machine is doing. And this is done by this uh, typically pulse position modulation. You, of course, need a very fast clock. Uh, this is in the megahertz order in order to be able to uh, put the correct timestamp on the uh, pulse uh, generation. And so, for instance, existing speed sensors can be used if their location turns out to be OK. So um, this, of course, uh, is related to the mode shape, the deformation, which, is, uh, which corresponds to the natural frequency of interest. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Um, typically, um, fictitious torsional vibrations are overcome uh, by learning how the geometry of the tooted wheel is. Uh, so this is, um, for instance, included in, in, in the software. Um, but if you do not do this, you will have, um, you could have components at once and uh, once uh, harmonics at the rotational speed. Uh, so of course, not uh, tooted wheel is not perfect uh, by uh, manufacturing. There's all, always slight differences uh, between in the different teeth. Um, if you connect a zebra tape, for instance, onto the shaft, um, which is a tape where you have white and black uh, marks, uh, as you can see on the second figure here the, for the optical um, probes, there typically you have an end effect um, where you have one larger black or white uh, pulse. So there again, you need to um, overcome this in, in the software. The signal quality, of course, is important because you are generating pulses and you're measuring the time in between pulses. Um, so any disturbance that comes onto the signal uh, should be minimized in order not to disturb the uh, post-processing. So the EMC, the electromagnetic compatibility of the entire measurement chain is an important asset of any torsional vibration measurement system. Some examples here, so as already explained, uh, your um, standard speed sensor is a Hall effect sensor and typically sees a change in the magnetic field. So it's placed uh, on a tooted wheel at a distance typically of less than one millimeter and it senses the passing of every tooth. The same principle is given in the second example where you have an optical probe which is looking at a zebra tape. So there, the instead of magnetic, it's optical. Um, here we recommend only to use this as a temporary measurement because, um, because it's optical, the zebra tape tends to uh, get, get some, some, some dirt or some dust on it and so the measurement then uh, gets disturbed. So typically this is good for temporary measurement campaigns or to calibrate another sensor uh, to validate the, the model, for instance. Um, so these are also options. The third one is an encoder, um, which we have installed already in quite some uh, power plants. These should be installed at the shaft end. And this is the advantages It's a very a high precise torsional vibration uh, measurement device, which is as well optical. So your zebra tape, if you will, is uh, within the encoder. Besides these uh, pulse position based measurements, so where you generate pulses, you also have measurements which are based on stress and strain. For instance, the top one, the inverse magnetostrictive sensor uh, has been developed by Laborelec actually in the 80s, 90s. And this sensor is placed very close to the shaft, also within uh, one millimeter. 
and it senses a stress change of the material. So when the material is stressed, you change the magnetic susceptibility of the material and uh, actually this change the magnetic induction and so uh, this is sensed by the sensor. So the advantage of this sensor is that it's contactless, it's a direct stress strain measurement. The disadvantage is that it's sensitive to the air gap. Um, typically the sensor needs calibration and this is typically done when going from the full speed no load to a nominal power. Then you have from zero torque on the shaft line, you go to the nominal torque and this is used to calibrate the sensor. However, the air gap also changes within this period when going from full speed no load to, to uh, the nominal load due to thermal effects, for instance, and so this disturbs the calibration of the sensor. This is one of the reasons why we do not use this sensor anymore, um, mainly due to these uh, calibration issues. The advantage, of course, is there, it's that it's a direct measurement of stress strain, but it's uh, sensitive to these air gap differences. Below you see strain gauges, a typical example of a direct measurement of strain, but it's less straightforward to implement and it's uh, less ro robust on the long term, so it's not typically used. In general, the most standard used probe for torsional vibrations is the Hall effect one. These are also the standard one used for the speed measurements and you can use these existing ones um, in a torsional vibration measurement campaign if they're well positioned and and this is shown on the next uh, plot so the blue color uh, demonstrates where you should position the pulse position sensors so these should be placed on locations where you have high torsional vibration amplitudes so for the top figure where you have the lowest vibration mode, these would be ideally placed at the shaft ends. There you have the highest torsional vibration amplitude. The strain-based sensors, they should of course be placed where you have high stresses. So this means that the shaft end for these types of sensors is never a good position because your shaft is not stressed there. So you need to position them on positions as you see for instance on the top figure in the middle between the compressor and the generator where you have the highest stresses. Um, you can see from the deformation that um, near the along the, the, the gas turbine and the compressor there's almost no relative twist so there's no torsional shear strain there neither in the generator. The only deformation the twist all happens in the intermediate shaft in between the gas turbine and the generator. So that's where you would position your stress-based sensor. The pulse-based would be less ideal to be placed uh, there. So this was a brief overview of how to measure torsional vibrations. You can do it by pulse position sensors, so your standard speed sensor, or by stress strain based sensors. The most typically used ones in, in most systems are the Hall effect sensors as your typical speed sensor. Sometimes one sensor is sufficient. Of course, you need two for redundancy. Sometimes you need more depending on the shaft line. If it's a steam turbine, you could have, you would maybe need uh, two to three sensors uh, over the entire shaft line. It depends on the shaft line configuration. So how to assess the criticality? Well, this is done with the following overview. The torsional vibration amplitudes, if your shaft is experiencing torsional vibrations, then you are putting torsional shear on the shaft. As you are vibrating, this means that you are putting stress or strain cycles on the shaft at certain positions. So the damage mechanism of torsional vibrations is fatigue. This means the rotor can only bear a limited number of cycles if the amplitudes are large enough. 
You have, of course, the endurance limit. So if you have very low torsional vibration amplitudes, you could have an infinite life because you're not accumulating fatigue damage. Once you go beyond the endurance limit, you will start accumulating fatigue damage and you will reach at a certain moment in time crack initiation if the amplitudes are large enough. So any assessment of how critical are my torsional vibrations should be based on fatigue lifetime considerations. And this is what is shown here on this slide. This is how you should calculate the fatigue lifetime and how you should assess the criticality. The top left shows the schematic view of the shaft line with three sensors. So this is a shaft line here in Belgium where we have sensors at both shaft ends and also one sensor in between the low pressure steam turbine and the generator. So once these measurements are post-processed, these torsional vibration measurements, you need some way to interpret them. And the only way to do that is by using a torsional vibration model. This is shown on the figure below. Um, the torsional vibration model is um, typically used, uh, for instance, to, um, as you can see here, you'd subdivide the rotor in, in several different segments, up to 300, for instance. And this allows you with a very good accuracy to determine theoretically the torsional natural frequencies and as well the corresponding deformation at each frequency. The deformation shown here is the deformation that corresponds to the lowest natural frequency of this shaft line. And here this shaft line is uh, more or less at seven hertz. On the, the, the figure below, the deformation, you can see the stress distribution. So you can see that, as you would expect, the highest stresses occur in the intermediate part where you have the largest gradient in the deformation. That is where all the action happens, and this is the most critical location of the shaft line. So the torsional vibration model shows you the correlation between the torsional vibration amplitude that you measure at a certain position and the stress that the shaft experience on any other position. So torsional vibration measurement is a model-based monitoring. You're not measuring at the critical location, but you're measuring at a point where you have high torsional vibration amplitudes, for instance, and you use the model to determine the stresses at a different location on the shaft line. So this is important to highlight. You need the torsional vibration model to assess the criticality. This has to be done for every natural frequency. So when the torsional when the shaft line is excited in torsional vibrations, you will excite it at different torsional eigenfrequencies. So you need to have dedicated bypass filters at each of those frequencies, which tell you what the correlation is of a certain vibration amplitude and the stress experienced by the shaft. Once this is done, as you can see on the right, you will have a time plot figure which shows you the shear strain you experience at a critical location. And then the standard-based uh, rain flow counting technique, for instance, where you determine the number of cycles you have at a certain shear strain amplitude uh, based on this time plot. This is typically a, a rain flow counting. So this gives you number of cycles and for each cycle, uh, what shear strain amplitude or shear stress amplitude you have experienced. And then you check with the strain life curve what the damage is, how many cycles you can bear. So the figure on the uh, bottom right shows you the strain life curve. And this shows you for a certain shear strain amplitude how many cycles you can bear 
until you reach a crack initiation. So the number of cycles to crack initiation. What you do with the rainflow counting is you identify the number of cycles you have at each shear strain amplitude and you determine the ratio in between the number of cycles you had, so the small and y, and you compare it to the number of cycles you can bear. And this ratio determines the fatigue lifetime you are um, accumulating, you are consuming. The Paul Grimm minor rule says, um, and this is typically used in literature, a linear summation of all different cycles with their uh, shear strain amplitude. One and the summation, once these, this summation gives you a ratio of one, you have a shear strain, you have uh, accumulated your lifetime and you will have induced a crack. So this summarizes the entire procedure uh, to assess the criticality. If you measure a torsional vibration based on the model, you determine the uh, corresponding stress levels and then based on the strain life uh, curve, you determine for each stress level, what are the number of cycles I can bear at this amplitude. Um, so to summarize, the underlying theoretical model is indispensable. This is really important. It's a model-based monitoring. You do not mo monitor at the most critical location, but you measure at one location and you determine the uh, cyclic stress and fatigue lifetime at a different location. You need dedicated filtering required to separate the different frequency components. And the model typically is very accurate. So the error is in the one to two her, uh, percentage. Uh, so this is really very, very good, at least for the lower modes. Uh, an example is shown in the table on the right, where you can see for a steam turbine shaft line, the error, um, which is lower than 2% for nearly, for all modes here. So that's the advantage um, of torsional vibrations. The model is not that complicated and you can reach a quite a good accuracy. And so the correlation between the measurements and the assessment is uh, quite well done. So moving on to monitoring protection. And now that we've seen how to measure and how to assess the criticality, uh, these should all be now included within a torsional vibration monitoring and protection system. Um, actually, Laborlec has quite a lot of experience already in this field, more than 30 years uh, since the late 70s, where the understanding of torsional vibrations was not that clear at the time. So the risk assessment was done by means of um, exciting deliberately the shaft line by means of short circuit, load rejection, synchronization errors, so all typical transient uh, events, and then measure mechanically by means of strain gauges and optical sensor at, at that time, as well as electrically at the generator, the voltage and current um, values. Simulations were also performed at that time, so the model of the shaft line uh, as well as the grid in, in order to be able to assess the lifetime. The main goal at that time was risk assessment and race understanding. Do torsional vibrations damage the machine when these are excited by typically occurring grid transients like short circuits, um, switching operations? So this was at that time the main goal. Throughout the years, I'm not going to explain all of them, um, there were several measurement campaigns, uh, all with different uh, goals. Um, here, for instance, one um, at a combined cycle gas turbine in the late 90s, where the power plant was located nearby large arc furnaces known to uh, potentially interact with the power plant. Um, so there, the power plant experienced important power oscillations and a measurement campaign uh, with the magnetostrictive sensor uh, developed by Laborlec was done, as well as electrical measurements to uh, determine really the cause for these torsional vibrations and to show the insurer that really the large arc furnace is uh, the cause for the torsional vibration amplitudes at the uh, power plant. 
Permanent systems has, have already been installed um, on, on nearly all nuclear units in Belgium. So on, this was on the demand of the insurer uh, with the focus on determination of the eigenfrequencies. Uh, they used different types of sensors, encoders, Hall effect, typically two to three uh, on the uh, shaft line. And it's a continuous, continuous measurement system, including uh, alarming and auto storage of important events. Now, these last years in South America, there were some uh, important issues uh, with uh, rotor shaft cracks uh, after two to 300 hours after the commissioning of uh, a gas turbine power plant. And this raised the awareness as well at all the power plants nearby uh, to do the risk assessment. And so there we have installed a dedicated protection system against uh, this potential interaction. Uh, and also remote support and close follow-up during the commissioning phase of the power plant. So these are examples showing the experience of Laborlec uh, now for more than 30 years already. Uh, here you can see an overview of the uh, typical torso configuration. So how does a torsional vibration monitoring protection system looks like? Well, it begins of course at the machine. So here it's a gas turbine. You can have one, two, three sensors. For a protection system, you need at least two to have the uh, required redundancy. The junction boxes with signal conditioning are shown close to the sensors. Typically, these are placed near the machine at, for instance, five to 10 meters. Uh, and then from these junction boxes, which uh, ensure that any disturbance on the signal is minimized, you go with the cable from the machine room to the instrumentation room. There again, it enters uh, a rack where you have, again, uh, conditioning of the, the signals and then the acquisition and post-processing. So this is in the torso cabinet and the torso acquisition system. The outputs uh, towards the DCS can be configured quite flexibly. Uh, typically, you have analog outputs showing the amplitudes at different uh, frequencies of interest. You have uh, alarm, watchdog, trip, digital outputs, uh, all redundant, of course, to ensure the robustness of the system. Um, remote follow-up is possible in the uh, commissioning phase and also the possibility of for the power plant to have a client terminal to do any uh, analysis um, of their own, just for transparency reasons. So now we are going to explain the different components of this overview, uh, mainly the junction boxes nearby the machine room and the torso rack itself, where all the acquisition and post-processing uh, is done. Um, so here you can see the torso uh, rack. So it's a 19-inch rack a standard, which can be put in any a uh, cabinet um, holds compact Rio and uh, RK uh, computer to um, store all the data that is being um, developed by the system. The hardware redundancy, as explained already, is important. This is on the sensor level um, and also on the different components level, so the power supply, the relay cards. So this is the system that you typically install in a cabinet, an existing one or a new one provided uh, by Laborelec. Signal conditioning, again, uh, close to the sensor typically or in the instrumentation room if the sensor, if an existing speed sensor can be used. Uh, the goal of the junction box is to have the power supply, signal conditioning, uh, noise reduction, or galvanic separation when using the existing uh, sensor. Um, and of course there it's uh, EMC tested uh, to ensure that any disturbance is not affecting the quality of the system. So key characteristics of the torso systems, typically you have two to three sensors. Uh, you can use existing ones um, when galvanic insulation is used or we can uh, add new ones, typically near to the wheels. Um, zebra tapes for temporary measurement campaigns, um, encoders at the shaft end, so different uh, options are, are possible. Communication towards the DCS of analog and digital outputs, so amplitudes at the different frequencies of interest as well as the digital outputs. 
uh, watchdog confirming that the system is running uh, as it should, uh, as well as uh, alarm and, and trip uh, signals. Typically, the alarm signal is set uh, below or uh, the fatigue endurance limit. So um, this shows that something abnormal is going on, but you're not uh, yet consuming lifetime. You have the potential of having online remote visualization. Um, so in real time, you see how the torsion vibration amplitudes are behaving. And uh, also more detailed uh, post-processing of the data is possible. Uh, again, for transparency uh, reasons. Any important event is uh, automatically stored um, in, in, uh, on the PC. Um, and typically, you have a circular buffer because you generate a large amount of data. Every timestamp of every pulse has to be stored. So typically, there you have a circular buffer of uh, a couple of weeks, for instance, and any important event is then stored permanently uh, on the hard drive. Installation of a system is typically less than one week. Um, if sensors have to be installed, you need a standstill to be able to install the sensors. Um, and the remote follow-up of the system is possible. For instance, if you have any changes in grid configuration, uh, like a new HVDC system, we can closely follow up if this um, excites the system in torsional vibrations, yes or no. Uh, also, when commissioning the power plant, sometimes it's useful to follow up remotely to check whether everything is working as it should. The software used to process all the measurements is in-house developed, so it's adjustable to the customer needs and shows a detailed data analysis, analysis and time in the frequency domain. Again, it's uh, typically pulse position detection that we use, so uh, a megahertz clock for high accuracy, teeth learning algorithm, and auto detection and correction of any missing pulses um, if these are even present. You have dedicated alarming for any subsynchronous torsional interaction. This means that you have bound pass filters which are tracking the different torsional vibration natural frequencies. So any resonance phenomenon that you might have will be identified by these uh, bound pass filters. The advantage as well is that you're not sensible to any potential signal disturbances because you are checking in a narrow frequency band. Circular buffer as explained a couple of weeks to months depending on the amount of sensors and auto storage of important events. And you could have as well a simultaneous acquisition of additional analog signals, for instance, electrical measurements near the generator. You could also trigger by means of this, by, by using the toshoid, you could trigger if you have alarm, um, the fault recorder, the electrical fault recorder to simultaneously record as well the electrical measurements. On the bottom right, you see an example, for instance, of what could be shown as a online uh, visualization where you have a status showing that everything is okay, alarm and trip level, as well as the real-time amplitudes uh, of the speed and the torsional vibrations. Implementation in the DCS, given an example here where you have some bar graphs showing the amplitudes at different frequencies, um, this can be uh, easily implemented in the DCS. A small word on the alarm and trip uh, limits. These are tuned case by case based on the model, the theoretical model, and also finite element simulation of the critical locations. So locations where you have uh, high stresses are modeled into detail with their stress concentrations or based on detailed geometry, or they can be uh, measured on site, uh, for instance, by means of scanning the um, parts of interest. It's tuned case by case, so every shaft line uh, has different alarm and trip limits depending on the material, uh, the type of shaft line, so this is really done case by case. Some examples, so we've now covered the Torsho system, um, so what is important is that it, um, that it is tuned on your system, so it's not a... Uh, there's no general torsional vibration measurement system. It has to be tuned. Details on the shaft line has to be, have to be available. Geometry, material, um, and if not available, um, some parts can be measured on site as well. Um, 
some examples here of measurement campaigns, uh, for instance, for a gas turbine here, uh, to give you a feeling of the amplitudes that you experience. Typically, in the static angle, so if you're running at nominal load, the static angle in between uh, both shaft ends is in the order of one degree. So this is just to transfer the nominal torque. Uh, you have one degree twist in between both shaft ends. Dynamically here, you can see, for instance, that during a start of the gas turbine, where you use a generator as a motor, you will excite torsional vibrations because the power electronics that you use to use the generator as a motor um, feed the arm generate generator arm armature current with harmonics. So as you can see on the bottom left picture, you're actually going in a transient resonance where you excite the lowest torsional natural frequency, which is around 17.5 hertz. You pass it fast enough, so there's no issue, but this is already useful to validate the model, for instance, um, prior to synchronizing to grid. I will skip these ones. Here is another example of a short circuit um, incident with where a crane was too sh close to a transmission line caused a single phase short circuit on a 380 kilovolt transmission line, which excites mechanically the shaft line. So you can see the event lasts uh, more or less 10 seconds. And if you go more into detail here, um, this shows you the amplitudes again of the twisting angle in between both shaft ends. It goes in the order of 0 0.5 degrees. To give you an example, once the fault appears, which lasts 72 milliseconds, you excite at 50 and 100 hertz in this example, so once and twice grid frequency. Um, and then you have the lowest torsional vibration uh, eigenfrequency, which is excited. So here, more or less 7 hertz with an amplitude of maximum 0 0.5 degrees. Um, a second reclosure um, is attempted one second later, but again, there was an issue, a new short circuit because the crane was again too close and the amplitudes are even uh, larger in this case. Um, in this event, the amplitudes were not dynamically magnified because um, the natural frequency is well oh, far, far enough away from once and twice grid frequency. So here, damage uh, has not been done. There's not a lot of uh, fatigue lifetime accumulation. So here, this event was uh, assessed as not critical. A last example is a nearby arc uh, furnace, um, which was disturbing the shaft line. Electrical, torsional, and radial vibrations were made, as you can see. And here you can see the results. Uh, the torsional natural frequencies on the bottom left picture are at 9 and 28 hertz. And these are excited as soon as the arc furnace is operation, as you can see on the top uh, left picture. This is really a steady state operation. From the electrical measurements, you can clearly see that there's a coupling between the mechanical and the electrical part. The fact that there's disturbance on the grid is shown in the H3 component of the current. And the fact that the torsional natural frequencies are coupled with the grid is shown by the measurements because the complement of the frequencies in torsion are shown in the voltage and current measurements. So the 28 hertz is shown at 22 hertz, for instance. The 9 hertz is shown at 41 hertz. So this is a typical example where you see the coupling in between the grid, the electrical arc furnace, and the power plant. So this. There's another example on wind turbines, maybe less of importance for most of you, but this is an ongoing project in order to assess the uh, criticality of a wind turbine shaft and to assess more into detail electrically and mechanically what does the shaft line sees, what is the damage that could be done on the gearbox uh, or the bearings of the wind turbine. So an example here for the wind turbine. So for instance, you can see that a normal stop almost has no dynamical content, while an emergency stop has a dynamic torque, which is even higher than a static torque. This, this is in a project, research project still, uh, but the basic principles are similar to the um, classical power plants. 
So this uh, summarizes the torsional vibration um, webinar. We've shown you the theoretical aspects, the practical aspects, how to measure, how to assess the criticality, as well as how a typical torsional vibration monitoring and protection system looks like. The most important concern with torsional vibrations is that it's not a standard monitoring on your shaft line and the grid interaction. Uh, if you have any changes in the grid, this could potentially harm your machine, um, but you will not see it because it is not, a, it is not monitored uh, by default. Um, so these are the most important uh, things to uh, remember from this uh, seminar. Yes, uh, thank you, Fritz. So now we will go through the question that you send us uh, via the chat. So uh, we have a first question from a Michael. Is, uh, is there an automatic assessment or localization on the software to locate where is the specific damage caused by the torsional vibration and how much damage the torsional vibration has caused? Um, okay, so thank you for that question. Uh, it's an important one. Um, the automatic assessment or localization um, of any critical location uh, has to be done um, theoretically by using the theoretical model of the shaft line. So that's uh, one thing that you have to use. I'm going to switch now to, for instance, this example here. You need the theoretical model of the shaft line to know where the highest uh, torsional shear stresses appear. And then you need even a more detailed, switching to another picture, detailed um, finite element model of the region of interest. So for instance, here of the intermediate shaft, you have a finite element simulation where you can assess the stress concentration. And by using this combination of the theoretical model and the finite element model, you identify at each frequency of interest the most critical uh, location. So this is already a guideline that you can use for inspections if you have any uh, torsional vibration issues or if you um, suspect that there are any uh, torsional vibration issues. The amount of damage that uh, is being caused by torsional vibrations uh, is assessed by means of the fatigue lifetime calculation. Um, you could have a rough estimation um, done in the sensor itself, but typically a more accurate one is done offline because you need the entire time history uh, to be able to assess the fatigue damage. Uh, typically it's a uh, counting of, of the cycles, uh, stress cycles that the machine experience and then based on the material properties, the strain life, you can assess and determine the accumulated uh, fatigue damage. Um, so a counter, if you will, um, over time. Okay, Th thank you, Fritz. Uh, you have a second question from Jason, uh, who asks approximately how long does it take to develop the model? Okay, thank you for that question. So the model, the information required to build the model are, um, are detailed geometrical drawings. Typically, we work with a well-known uh, subcontractor who has its own software. We also model shaft lines ourselves, um, but this company has a lot of experience in, and, and has a large uh, database already of uh, shaft lines which are modeled. But what you need is a detailed, uh, detailed theoretical drawings, technical drawings of the shaft line, as well as information on the steam turbine blades, the large blades, which have to be um, dynamically uh, included as well in the model. Once you have this information gathered, uh, building the model uh, takes um, yeah, maybe one to two weeks um, if the interest is only in the subsynchronous part, um, you could use a different approach. 
typically the subsynchronous model is more or less available. So the inertia of the main components is typically available. And if you're only interested in the subsynchronous part, you can derive a simplified model. And with this simplified model, you can already uh, perform a risk assessment, risk assessment of uh, having potential interaction with the grid. So this can be quite easy and quite fast with limited uh, amount of, of effort. Um, of course, to assess the criticality um, of any measured torsion vibrations, there you need more detail and there you would need a finite element model or measurement on site if uh, detailed drawings of uh, local geometry, for instance, a, a fillet radius, um, if this is not given in the drawings, then this would need to be assessed on site. So, and then it might take a little bit longer, but uh, the theoretical model can be set up in, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks. Um, so that's not, not, not really a problem. Okay, thank you, Fritz. Uh, it appears that we don't have uh, any more questions. If you still have one, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will uh, close now this uh, webinar. We will send the presentation uh, to all attendees. And uh, if you have uh, any other question or any other special request, uh, don't hesitate uh, to uh, email us or to call us and we will be glad uh, to uh, help you. So thank you very much and see you next time. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.